This is Father Patrick Briscoe. And this is Father Joseph Anthony Cress. Welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all who support us. If you'd like to make a monthly donation to us on Patreon, please do so. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcast. Friends, we are so excited today to have with us Francis Mayer, the author of the new book, True Confessions. True Confessions is a really excellent read, and it brings to bear, you know, Francis's life work as a veteran Catholic journalist, and then at really the heart of the administration of the church in major, two major U.S. archdioceses. So he brings a lifetime of experience to this work, and it, it, it actually is completely borne out in the text itself. So we're so excited, Francis, to welcome you to the show. Well, I'm delighted to excite anyone at my age. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, thanks for having me, Father. It's, it's good to be back with friends. True Confessions uh, is so unique. I mean, that, that's what, ca what caught me about this. This is 103 interviews that you compiled over 17 months. And uh, from my understanding and my, my appreciation of the work, you're, you were striving to capture an accurate snapshot of the Catholic Church in the United States to, to kind of look past all of the noise and say, well, beyond the commentary and news that's available to us, this is what the church actually is. This, this is what Catholics who are living at the heart mm -hmm. of the church are really thinking and saying. Uh, do you think you accomplished that in the book? Oh, I do indeed. Uh, you know, the interesting <laughs> thing is when, uh, when you finish a career, your first temptation is, well, I'm going to write the, the um, all-inclusive uh, explanation of the church in the United States. And, and of course, other people have already done that pretty well, whether, it's tr whether they've been true or not is another matter. But, but uh, <laughs> the, 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 I, it just occurred to me that in all the years that I worked for, for the church, the people in the pews uh, who tend to be uh, quite faithful and, and pretty articulate didn't get an opportunity to talk. And, and, you know, we heard a lot of really wonderful stuff from people like Rusty Reno and, and George Weigel and a lot of other people. But the people who actually lived the day-to-day -day faith didn't, don't have much of an opportunity to be heard. And so I thought, well, instead of me spending 100 and uh, the time for 103 interviews on myself, I'd go out and I'd actually talk to bishops and priests and deacons and uh, lay people who do the work of the church. And I think what, what emerges from that is uh, two things. Number one, we have an almost... Um, bottomless ability to defeat ourselves by being negative and, and whining. And the other thing is, is there's an enormous amount of apostolic agents, uh, agency and activity that just simply doesn't get acknowledged in the mainstream media because it's not to their purposes. And, uh, you know, I, not to, not to drag the, my answer out too much, but I mean, the, the, the donors that I interviewed who are generous to these apostolic works and the apostolic works themselves are just extraordinary. And I wanted people to know that so that they're not constantly depressed and miserable, which is one of the temptations of the age. Um, Fran, when, when you're looking at this, I, I see that there's more of a recent thing, um, this kind of turning of the spotlight, you know, away from the kind of titled positions of the church mm -hmm. into more of the localized experience. You know, uh, we've seen that there's a tremendous uh, and studies have shown this, you know, especially the the recent study out of Catholic University of America, that there's a tremendous trust in the local pastor and a tremendous devotion um, to the local. Look, um, let me put it this way. In... Yeah, I'm, I, Father, the way that I would respond to that is that um, people don't spend a lot of time complaining about stuff that they don't love. I mean, they leave basically mm -hmm. eventually, you know, and and. Uh, what struck me about about the interviews that I did is that they're they're very frank. I mean, they they these are people who really know what the problems on a on a daily level are in the church, but that doesn't defeat their love. It it increases it because mm -hmm. they they want the church to be who she is. They want her to be as perfect as she can be, and um, and so rather than in the end, rather than it being a kind of a compilation of everything that's wrong with the world, it's a compilation of people who really love and are working to make the church as pure and as effective as she is. That's particularly striking, by the way, in the chapter that I did on, um, I think it's called Here Comes Everybody, where I, where I interview, I think, uh, 10 women and 10 men who are in formation mm -hmm. positions. I mean, basically educators and, and parents. And um, the women are, are really pretty extraordinary. I mean, they're, they, their love for the church is, is quite striking. The men are smart, but the, men are, the women are actually smarter. I guess that's not 
big surprise, but, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, they're just very uplifting and, and father Patrick and I were talking before we began about, um, the chapter on special people, you know, I think Mm -hmm. parents of of, uh, children who are either adopted or have special needs in other ways. And, uh, their, their witness is just, I mean, really uh, quite moving. So again, that's a reason to be it's a reason to be quite positive about the church, I think. One of the things that's so striking to me, Fran, is that um, you were able to engage a conversation at a really authentic level. You know, it seems like so many places and so many times in the church, we we talk past each other. How is it that you were able to get people to to open up and really, really get to some of the questions that lay at the heart of their experience? You know, for example, you have all of these conversations with with bishops and mm-hmm. Uh, I have never heard, apart from, you know, very, very few isolated incidents, I have never heard bishops speak like they were speaking in these interviews that you collected. What's it that prompted that? And how did you get these these really heartfelt and authentic testimonies? Well, it helps that I worked for Archbishop Shappy for 23 years without getting fired. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I mean, the bishops are aware of the the lives of other bishops. And I think that going into the, into requesting the interviews, they knew that um, I, I, how to, I knew how to keep a confidence and I knew how to treat them with a certain amount of basic respect. And so it was fairly easy to get the 30 men that I did to, to, I think only two, I contacted, I think 33, one of them died before I could interview them before I could interview them. And the other two didn't respond, but the other, but 30 of them, uh, from 20 to five different states agreed. And, um, I made, uh, I made the decision to make those anonymous, um, because I already know that bishops are in a position where anything they say can be jumped on by the right or the left. And I just wanted to remove that as an anxiety. So once they really understood that, um, the interviews were anonymous, uh, they, they relaxed, let their hair down, uh, and, and, uh, were very frank. And I, I, you know, personally, I, I don't know, people will react differently to them, but I, I was, um, I was not surprised, uh, by, by the quality of the men, because that's been my experience for the 45 or 40 more, 45 more years that I've, I've worked in the church, but they're very human, yeah. as you just mentioned. I mean, they're very human. They have all the problems that we do they're, It's a 24 seven job, uh, and, uh, without a whole lot of, <laughs> without a whole lot of the 11th century's positives that go with, you know, being a big shot. I mean, there's just, it's a tough job and they, they, they're, they're good men trying to do their best. I was speaking to one recently who was ordained a bishop in 2018 and he described that moment as the Episcopocalypse, <laughs> <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> which I had not heard, but I, had, I was just filled with sympathy for him. And, and that was the effect of, of reading these testimonies mm-hmm. and, you know, as a member of the Catholic press, our, our, our favorite thing is to, to praise the thing we like, praise the things we like that they do, and then to, to destroy them when they fail to impress mm-hmm. or, or please us. And uh, I think that's the sense of, of most Catholics at large. But, but what, what you did was, was create a, a, you know, a sympathy and an openness to the, to the job, to the role, to the vocation properly said, uh, that, that, that I hadn't seen or experienced. Well, there's a, you know, that Episcopal uh, thing that reminds me of a bishop. Uh, this was a guy out West that I interviewed and right away at the beginning of, he said, you know, when I was ordained, one of my very good friends leaned over and said, John was the only apostle who died in his bed. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, goodness. So, uh, it's a positive, you know, going into a ministry saying, you know, you're probably going to get martyred, yeah. but, but, uh, uh, it just, I, they just, you know, some of them had a wonderful sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of them, uh, really touched on some of the suffering of the job. I mean, that the, one of the bishops that I interviewed talked about how some of the toughest treatment he had received as a bishop was from other bishops. He also talked about the, uh, crisis of fatherhood in the priesthood and that bishops haven't done a good enough job in, 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 um, in really being supportive of their priests which of course is reflected in the priest view of the bishops mm-hmm. in a lot of cases, but it's just, you know, I, I like, you, you can't fix a problem. You can't heal a sickness unless you know what the root of the problem is. And I think one of the strengths of the interviews that emerged from the, from the project was uh, people just telling the truth, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. people telling their truth in love, like Paul 
told us to do. And, and the result is, I think, a cleansing feeling when you come away from it, that you've encountered reality, but it's not a bad reality. And it's important to get there so that the church can be an evangelical witness in the world the way it's, she's supposed to be. By the way, that pronoun is very important for me. And I think mm -hmm. the church in general, you, you'd know this better than anyone, but a lot of lay people talk about the church as an it. And of course, the church has institutional structures right. that are neuter, you know, uh, but that's not her. I mean, the, the, you can't fall in love with the Ford company. <laughs> you, can fall, <laughs> you can fall in love with the church because of her Marian nature, her mm -hmm. motherly nature, yeah. her feminine nature. And and um, that's what's kept me going throughout my career. I mean, we, we talk about um, this encounter with the reality and kind of walking away cleansed and maybe even hopeful in how the church as a mother and, and a bride um, nurtures us. Like, through these hundred and some odd interviews, that deeper encounter with the reality and then walking away kind of cleansed with hope and nurtured for the future. Where do you see that trend is going? Where Where is the, you know, the largest hope moving forward um, to be nurtured by our mother, the church? Well, pressure turns coal into a diamond. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, uh, I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. Ratzinger was right 50 years ago, father, you know, this as well as yeah, I do. I, know. I mean, he read it like, he read <laughs> it like a book 50 years ago. You know, the people, it's sad when people um, leave the church, yeah. when the tepid leave the church and we have an obligation to try to, to try to bring them back or to keep them in the fold, but it's not the end of the world. I mean, it's, if it's true, it's good. And, and if people leave, that leaves people who are committed mm -hmm. and uh, that that committed core um, is the source. And as this is look, this isn't the first time we've been through this. We've been through this a dozen times over history. You know, the the, the uh, decline, the corruption, those all go with the, uh, they, those things provide the soil for the renewal of the church. You know, one of the things that I, I've been big on for for the last 15 years and nobody listened to me, but now <laughs> but now they're beginning to the, the is that we really are living through a new kind of reformation. And by that, I mean, a, not not, you know, the 16th and 15th century period, but but because there's so many radical differences. I literally mean reformation, a restructuring uh, or um, reimagining of 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 society, culture, and the human person. And it's a really critical moment because it's a, number one, it's extremely dangerous if it goes the wrong way, but mm. it's also an opportunity for renewal and a new kind of evangelical witness in the church. And that's how we need to understand it. The, the, um, we got a big problem, but the church has always had a big problem mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we're all sinners and the church is a sinful and the, and the world is a, is a flawed place. So this is a great, it's not a bad time to be a Christian. It's exactly the opposite. It's a really terrific time to be a Christian mm -hmm. if we understand mm -hmm. what the vocation of the church is. And, uh, you know, I, when I use that, when I, excuse me for, for uh, patting myself on the back, but, <laughs> you know, when I, but when I said this 10 years ago, it was like, who is this guy and where is he coming from? Uh, it, I think the, there are all sorts of names for it, the great reset, the upheaval, but what, they're all talking about the same thing, mm -hmm. this kind mm -hmm. of major inflection point in the culture. A perfect example. I mean, one of the interviews that I did in the, in the book was with Carl Truman, who's of course mm -hmm. a Presbyterian minister, really very Catholic friendly. I mean, a really good friend. And, you know, he talked about the fact that um, the, the, we're, we're going through this sort of, he used the example of the printing press. He said the printing press basically triggered it was invented for a completely different reason, but what it did is he triggered basically 150 years of political and economic and social turmoil uh, innovation. We're living through a time that I think can best be ex best be demonstrated by the fact that uh, 30 years ago there were less than 2,000 personal and business websites in existence. There are more than two billion now. And that information revolution drives all sorts of other fundamental mm -hmm, mm -hmm. restructuring of culture. And it leaves all of us confused and just kind of grasping for some kind of solid ground to stand on. So the task of what, what, what does the church bring to that task? Well, I mean, it brings the message of salvation, of course, but it also brings the, uh, the, the tremendous gift of remembering, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. 
just remembering who we are, remembering history, grasping it as a, as a base for, for uh, okay, we can be hopeful because we've seen this before in some form, and this isn't really all that new. Um, so I think, I, think, um, I think the big sin of our age is the, is the loss of personal agency. And I think our culture very much encourages that. If you look at the economic realities that we're living through that are being driven by the information culture, information um, and cultural changes that, that relate to it. I mean, I think, and I, 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 if I'm remembering the statistics, statistics right now, 10%, the upper 10% of our economic, um, upper 10% economically of our culture controls 70% of the nation's wealth. The bottom 50% of, of um, our, our earners control 2.5% of the wealth. Wow. And that wow. gulf is, is accelerating. Yeah. It's not getting better. It's accelerating faster in the United States than in any other advanced economy. Now that has psychological and social consequences that are enormous. And they all take away power from the individual. Um, and of course, what's the church about? The church is about personal responsibility, personal vocation. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the perfect antidote to the kind of culture that we're in, but we have to own it. We have to understand uh, the, 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 the real problems in the church and the real, um, the real opportunities in the church in order to, to have any kind of organized answer to the, to, to the cultural issues that we've got. I hope that makes some sense, yeah. but. Yeah, certainly. And it points to, I mean, what, what is, uh, I think, a, you know, a kind of an unusual and another very interesting aspect of the book is your emphasis on how the laity have contributed to the church yes. in recent years. And that, that is absolutely one of the hallmarks of, of this inflection point. I think Father Joseph Anthony was kind of hinting at this um, when we look at the moments of renewal, where, where they've come from. Mm -hmm. They've been um, largely, not exclusively, but largely led by lay movements. I like to think that religious have contributed something as well. <laughs> yeah. but, but... Well, you guys are reformers. That's your whole, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Dominicans are, are, you know, a reform movement. I mean, it's, it's one of the wonders of the, of, of the church that things like the Franciscans and the, and the Dominicans exist because that's how reform happened in mm -hmm. an earlier period. Mm -hmm. And I, it's certainly something that, you know, Shappy brought to, to Denver was a sympathy with lay movements precisely because he was a religious. Mm -hmm. I like to think that that's what's what's driven a lot of our success. Our most um, pronounced endeavors, you know, have been enriched um, and driven, frankly, by by lay partnerships. You know, um, like this project, God's Planning, where we invite our our <laughs> friends onto the show to chat with us. At what what do you think? Um, what do you think? You know, taking this a little bit further, what do you think that that the lady can do? Um, you were emphasizing personal, uh, this personal responsibility. What do you think the lady can do even, in, even in the most local level? So someone reads this book and they hear a lot about leadership. They see people that have founded apostolates. What should, what should, you know, the, the, the mass going Catholic, the Catholic in the pew take away? Well, <clears throat> how do I, how do I, well, first of all, I think what lay people need to do is to find out what God wants them to do. And they do that not by becoming lectors. <laughs> you, know, <I> mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, look, at my, my wife is a lector and I'm not under, I'm not, I don't take anything away from that. But, <clears throat> you know, our, our job as lay people is not to get positions within the institution. I, I'm kind of an oddity because I had a, I had a position for my entire career, but that's very unusual, actually. Um, our job is to be in the world and to work cooperatively with the clergy. And, um, and so how do you find out what to do? Well, you know, if you're not reading scripture on a daily basis or spending some time in adoration, you can't listen to what God wants mm -hmm. you to do. Mm -hmm. And he may just be asking you to start a, a prayer group or to start a, a discussion group of books or to get involved with the Knights of Columbus. Good Lord, that's, the, that's an enormous um, organization that does tremendous good work. And it's, it's a lay organization. Uh, so the thing to start, the, the, the baseline for lay, the lay vocation is to find a way to disconnect from the noise of the culture around them and, and listen for the word of God. And you do that by actually send, spending some time with the word of God and spending some time in, in, in daily prayer. I mean, in adoration, in addition, of course, obviously to mass and the Eucharist. And then after that, um, I mean, God will tell you what to do. I never anticipated my job. I mean, I wanted to be a screenwriter and, and the, the, 
I just fell into this and listened to the opportunities that were uh, provided to me to to make a contribution in this particular manner. I mean, God makes it clear to people who ask him, if they ask him con continuously and sincerely what he wants them to do, then he'll, he'll, he'll give an answer, you know, and it, it may be, I don't know, maybe founding an organization or joining an organization or simply taking the Eucharist to, to the sick. All those things are tremendously valuable. They, they, they feed the soul and the soul is being starved by our, our culture, which is the most materialist in history. When we were together at uh, Benedictine College last spring, it was the first time I heard you uh, start speaking about the book. And when, when you presented the project, um, you, gave, you gave a beautiful personal testimony that, that I think will resonate with many of our listeners, these men and women who, uh, who like us, like yourself, are people who desire clarity and mm -hmm. are, are, are wounded by and frustrated by so much of the confusion cultural and ecclesial that we're facing. Uh, but you, you gave a beautiful testimony about how you began to be transformed in the face of otherwise what would have been such a temptation to anger. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I was hearing is... an echo. I was <laughs> hearing an echo of that, you know, in, in what you just proposed, you know, go, yeah. go pray yeah. with the word of God, sit in front of the blessed sacrament and listen to the Lord. Well, any of the men who are listening to this, uh, who are who are married, I would encourage you not to do this at home, because uh, <laughs> you'll get the truth. I, I was getting ready for confession uh, one day, and I asked my wife of uh, you know Sue and I have been married for almost fifty four years now, and I asked her, well, what do you think my primary problem is? I thought I was assuming it was going to be vanity or procrastination or impatience. She just laughed at me and she said, "You've got a major problem with anger." And the more I thought about it, 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 it's true. I'm angry about a lot of stuff. I live most of my life in my head. And what that means is that all the conflicts of the culture are buzzing around as hornets in my brain all the time. And mm -hmm. I think, here's the lesson. If you want to understand what the real virus in the United States is, it's uh, people, it's the issue of anger. I mean, most of the people I know are angry about something a lot of the time. And if you multiply that by 30 or 50 or 120 million people, you've got a diseased culture. And so um, I thought about that. And um, a, a, a Protestant friend, and actually an ex-Catholic, a really good Christian man, uh, said, you know, Fran, do you read scripture every day? And I said, well, of course I do. It's my job. You know, I use it all the time. And he said, no, I don't mean do you use it. Do you let it speak to you? And and so I began reading. Uh, I began reading scripture, you know, the Psalms. I've got a two or three favorite Psalms that I, pardon me. And, um, and if you just read three chapters of the New Testament every day in, in sequence from, you know, the first verse of Matthew to the last verse of Revelation, I mean, you really have a different experience of, of, of scripture. And I don't think a lot of Catholics do that. Or a lot more do now than they did like 50 years ago, but it has a calming effect. Um, and also a it, it forces you into a direct engagement with the person of Jesus Christ rather than the idea of Jesus Christ, which is where a lot of the current theological fights are taking place is just at the conceptual level rather than this kind of personal engagement level. So that really made a big difference for me. I'm still, I'm still, uh, uh, Sue would be happy to tell you that I'm not perfect, you know, <laughs> Go <laughs> into great detail about it, but that, you know, that really had an effect on me. I think that has helped. You know, friend, when we look at the the interviews and the profiles that you have, you have a hundred over a hundred of these. A hundred. What, what's the final number? One thirty. Was it? One hundred and three. Yeah. One hundred and three. One hundred and three. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at that, I mean, how how did you come to uh, these individuals? I mean. There, I mean, there's so many Catholics in the United States, so many devoted, faithful that are uh, in the pews and everything. But what was some of the process of like choosing these uh, individuals, and why would you uh, kind of section or kind of group them together the way that you have? Well, the bishops were easy, Father, because <clears throat> I wanted it to be a national portrait rather than uh -huh. um, just guys that I knew. I do know mm -hmm. some of them. I mean, some of them are very good family yeah. friends, two or three of them. Mm -hmm. But but uh, but I wanted to, you know, get a mix of um, metropolitans and suffragans. And there are a couple of auxiliaries in there and um, rural and urban. So I mean, that was that was the easy part. 
Um, mm -hmm. The rest of the people that I interviewed were people that I had accumulated as friends or colleagues over a 45 year period. And the chapter on um, uh, fixing the machinery, well, that was very obviously Philadelphia yeah. because uh, we came from a very healthy diocese in Denver to one that was in a, ca a catastrophe in, um, in Philadelphia. I mean, this, I don't know how many people know this story, but when, when Archbishop Shapu was appointed to uh, Philadelphia, he knew about the legal and, and uh, political problems that the, that the church had. But <laughs> the, the added bonus was finding out at a very late stage that we were $300 million in the, in, in, uh, below, the, you know, below the line and, and had been running $10 million deficits for like 15 years. So, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, the first three years were not a lot of laughs. And, and, um, and uh, he just did a sp spectacular job of, of uh, turning things around and either eliminating the problems or making them substantially less urgent. Mm -hmm. um, but that, in that case, it was just dealing with people who were very much involved in the experience of the catastrophe and the fixing of it. So that was, mm -hmm. you know, pretty easy. Um, the special people, I knew those guys, you know, they're people yeah. who I, yeah. who I know have, have been raising children. And, um, it, you know, my, my personal, that's my personal favorite chapter. Uh, but I also just enjoyed, I wanted, I wanted to have a record of certain men that had had a enormous influence on my life. I mean, uh, and, and most Americans mm -hmm. won't know who Jean Duchesne is, for example, but he's a, he's a tremendously fruitful lay, uh, lay person for the church in the 20th century because he had a, he had a very intimate relationship with uh, Cardinal Jean-Marie Lustiger, who was one of the great Catholic leaders of the last century. And uh, he uh, was co-founder of French Communio, for example, and he knew de Lubac and Bouillet and all these other people. So, I mean, I want, he's got a great life story and I wanted that portrait. Of course, Chappie was a terrific interview. He's, <laughs> he's nothing if not direct. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and Father Fessio is a hoot. I mean, I've known Father, yeah. actually Father Fessio is the, uh, the godfather of our, of our daughter. And, uh, mm, he's, mm -hmm. I've known Joe for, well, for 45 years and he's, uh, he's got a very, uh, ironic sense of humor, which I enjoy a lot. So, I mean, those are things that I, that, that were just kind of gifts to myself, but they're also very interesting portraits of men who had a real significant role in the, in the church. So, um, that was kind of a self-indulgent chapter, but yeah. the, the others yeah. are all people that I knew and admired over a very long period of time. And I knew they were faithful and I knew they also told the truth mm -hmm. uh, and wouldn't uh, kind of sentimentalize the church, which I don't think is very helpful. No, but our love for the church is real. And that, yeah. those are some of the most touching words in the book and his um, very complimentary foreword. Archbishop Chapu encourages everyone to pick this book up because it's written by a man who, above all, has a great love for the church. And I, mm -hmm. I think few things could, could better describe all the work you've done for, for the church, done for our mother, the church, um, these many years, Fran. Can so, I tell you before we, before we leave, I, I have to tell you uh, a, a gift that he gave me. This was about 20 years ago. I remember coming into my office one day. It really, it really captures his sense of humor. Uh, I came into the office one day and uh, there was a little gift on my desk and it was a little wooden pla motivational plaque in, in wood <laughs> and burned into the wood on the front was where the words, um, it is as bad as you think and they are out to get you. <laughs> 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 so, so um, he had, he had a, a very dry <laughs> sense of humor. <laughs> Uh, and of course, he, I mean, you, there's no doubt that the archbishop loves the church. He said, but he, you know, he, he, the thing I think what here, I think Catholics really need to, uh, Rod Dreher wrote a wonderful book a few years ago called the Benedict option, where he was talking about the importance of using Benedict as a, as a model for cat, for Christians today. And I think it's a good book. It's a very good book, but I think the better example is Augustine, Augustine, mm -hmm. um, you know, was a fabulous bishop. He he lived in an extremely difficult time, very much like our own. He was always faithful to his his ministry as a bishop. He uh, started out as a lay person, and he intended to do that, but he kind of got hijacked by the people of Hippo into being a priest and then a bishop. Uh, but he he 
was a man who was uh, very realistic and pessimistic about the world that he was dealing with, but he never lost hope. He was always a man of hope. And that was very much like the, my boss. I mean, Archbishop Chaput had a very realistic assessment of where we're at, but it never affected his, his it never affected his spirit of hope about the church because he, he, he grounded that hope in an absolute confidence in God. And, and that's what we need right now. That's probably the best reason our listeners need to get this book, because it is filled with that. It is absolutely filled with hope. Uh, so thank you so much for for writing it and for for joining us today. Oh no, this, I, it's been a it's been a, a delight. It. Believe me, I very much admire what you're doing, and you already know that. But they the, the audience doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so well, thank you for the kind words. We really yeah. appreciate it, friends. Thanks so much for joining us today for God's planning. If you are interested in supporting our project, please consider making a monthly donation to us on Patreon. You can follow God's Planning on all sorts of social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, now X, Instagram, TikTok, all the rest. For the latest updates on upcoming God's Planning events, check us out on our website, godsplaining.org. You can also on godsplaining.org shop for God's Planning merchandise. Get that perfect t-shirt that you've been looking for for this summer season. In the meantime, friends, we ask that you would pray for us, pray for our preaching, and to know above all of our prayers for you. God bless. God bless.